We are here today uh, in studio with Mel Wax. This is Marky Mark, and we're doing another episode of Ancient Biblical Coins. We have an expert numismatist with us today with his biblical beard, Mel Wax. <laughs> it's been a long time in the making. <laughs> yes. And uh, we got some slides queued up for you. And instead of uh, with Ira, we did interesting things about ancient coins. But today with Mel, we're going to do a deep dive. Is that right, Mel? And we right. have your book. Uh, let me see if I could show this to the camera. Handbook of Biblical Numismatics. And we're talking today with Mel Wack, the author of this book. Mel, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about your background, where you came from, what you've done, and... Right. Well, I was born in the Bronx, and uh, when I was 10 years old, my father gave me a little leather pouch of coins, Canadian. He was from Montreal and U.S., and uh, that started me. I still have the pouch in my right hand desk drawer to remind me, and uh, that started me off as a coin collector. So I collected U.S. coins, pennies, and, and so forth. I still have the collections. Mm -hmm. Years later, they started an Israeli coin club in New York. And I went down there, and I got hooked on uh, Israel coins, the modern coins, the ancient coins. And so uh, I just started collecting. I don't have a magnificent collection. In fact, I sold off some of the better ones, a shekel and a half shekel and so forth. But I still have over 100 bronze coins here that I'll have to sell off at some point. Mm -hmm. But it's hard separating from them because you hold, when you hold one of these coins in your hands, it's amazing. This is 2,000 years old. And you think of these Jews in Judea and the Christians and everyone else who could have held these coins. And I'm so, I'm right there with you, Mel. I'm I'm coin crazy still. I got so I got your book here, Handbook of Biblical Numismatics. I got David Hendon's book right here. Who uh, in November uh, David's going to be on with me. Oh, um, great! I have this other beautiful book, which is a good coffee table book. Um, and right here, I have my whole stack of ancient biblical coins, which I, I showed Ira in the office there. So I got a few here up my sleeve if, uh, for reference if I have to break anything. Right out. behind me, I have over 100 books on ancient Jewish coins. Yes. And which I'm uh, contributing to the New York Public Library's Jewish division. Mm-hmm. So they'll have the uh, they'll have the collection there. So we have Mel slides here, and this is all from your book, is that right, Mel? From my right, book, this is from my book. Uh, I put it I put it together just for this show. And you notice I'm, I spell it J U D A E A, which is the way it was spelled then. Sometimes it's spelled J U D E A. I noticed today. Ah, uh, just a cursory view. Oh no, this is the real thing. This is a a, a full. Full course. And as I said, I'm looking forward to it because I, have, I haven't heard it yet either. <laughs> I just prepared it. <laughs> the map of the Holy Land changed often in ancient times. Sometimes it was a Jewish kingdom. Other times it was under the control of the Babylonians, the Persians, Seleucids, now Syria and Lebanon, and the Romans. Here's a map of the Jewish kingdom of King Solomon, around 971 to 931 BCE. Coins were not invented until a few hundred years later. Until then, many transactions were made by weighing pieces of silver using a rather sophisticated system of weights based on the shekel. Standard weights were polished domed stones, as you see here, engraved with the weight from fractions to multiples of a shekel. When we read in Deuteronomy where they talk about a shekel or Leviticus where a half shekel was the requirement to give to the Lord, at that point they didn't have all these mints. Coins had not been invented yet, so they had uh, little pieces of silver that they would weigh. And in fact, they have found some hordes of these small pieces of silver. Mm -hmm. So they would just uh, weigh them as a scale. 
So whenever they talk about collecting like a half shekel uh, uh, tax for each male, that was not a coin. Yes, it was one of these like smooth polished stones. Well, it wasn't, right? this was the stone that way that they use as weights mm -hmm. against mm. the silver. So, mm. okay. yeah, and each one is uh, is engraved at the top. So, so like in Leviticus, where each person had to present a half shekel, what would that look like then? Would it just be one of these stone weights made out of silver? No, no, it's not the stone weight. It's the silver with the same weight as the stone weight. Think of a scale, you know, as, as an old-time scale mm -hmm. where you put a weight on one side and the, and the material on the other side. That's, sure. that's the way they did it. The only coins mentioned in the Old Testament were used after the Holy Land was conquered by the Persians in 539 BCE. The Persian gold Dariks, named for King Darius, were issued almost unchanged in design from about 521 to 330 BCE. The Persian king Darius Xerxes or Artaxerxes is shown running with a spear sword and a bow and arrow or a bow and arrow. Ezra II chapters 68 and 69 indicate that and of the heads of the father's houses when they came to the house of the lord which was in jerusalem they donated to the house of god to erect it on its foundation according to their ability they gave to the treasury of the work gold and 61,000 drachmas of silver so this is the coin that's uh, a beautiful coin i happen to have uh, two of them right here in silver He's, uh, I'm going to similar silver siglos coins likely form the 10,000 talents of silver equal to approximately 90 million sigloi, if you believe it, paid by Haman into the king's treasuries so that the king would not would destroy the Jews. This is from the book of Esther. And you can get one of these for, I don't know, about $150 today. Amazing. By 440 BCE, the Jewish homeland was a province of Persia called Yehud, and that's where the first Jewish coins were issued. This coin is thought to be the very first or one of the first Jewish coins made. It is especially significant because it seems to portray the vision of prophet Ezekiel, which is, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the glory of the Lord, the deity is shown sitting on a winged wheel, just as Ezekiel relates. Behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures. And I'm, I'm in the process of writing an article about this coin. It's a very interesting coin. It, uh, you know, seemingly may show the, uh, the Jewish God. The Seleucid kingdom reached the zenith of its power, conquering Jerusalem in 198 BCE. Those are some beautiful... That's a Greek coin at the top? There. At the top is the coin of Athens, which mm -hmm. was a very popular coin in the ancient world. And uh, the... Uh, they copied they copied that coin, uh, but changed. Uh, you can see alpha, theta, epsilon on the right, mm -hmm. and on the Jewish coin below, it says Yehud, uh, Y H D, on the right in ancient Hebrew. According to the Book of Maccabees, Antiochus the seventh, the Seleucid king of Syria granted the last of the Maccabee brothers, Simon, leave also to coin money for the country with thine own stamp. Unfortunately, no Jewish coins of this period are known, perhaps because this right was withdrawn along with other political privileges extended to Simon after his murder. That's the coin of the Seleucids. This small bronze coin was issued by the Seleucid king Antiochus VII in 132 131 BCE. And this coin is actually, it has a date. The date isn't in BCE. <laughs> that would be funny. But the date is in the years of uh, the independence of, uh, of the city or mm -hmm. of the, uh, yeah, of the city. The anchor is a symbol 
of the Seleucid kingdom, and the lily is a symbol of the Jewish nation. The prophet Hosea in the 8th century BCE described the lily as the flower symbol of Israel. Quote, I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like the lily, and he will take root like the cedars of Lebanon. It's Hosea 14.5. This is a lovely coin. Again, you can get this for about $100. Now, is that a similar to the widow's mite with the anchor, or is that a different piece? It's about the same size as the widow's mite. Mm -hmm. The widow's mite is any coin, any uh, small bronze coin issued in Judea before uh, before the event of the actual event of the widow depositing it in the temple treasury, which is you can figure about one one thirty B.C. Oh, I'm sorry, thirty C.E. Oh, now the shekel of Tyre. Yeah, the shekel of Tyre. And there's Tyre. Tyre is in current, uh, you know, the Tyre is still there today. Mm. Okay. This is one of the most famous ancient coins. The silver shekels and half shekels issued by the Phoenician city of Tyre from 126 BCE to 66 CE. And you can see there's the date of, of uh, um, this is Baal, the Phoenician god, who is related to Hercules in mythology. And you can see the club of Her- Hercules uh, on the coin, and above it, Greek letters uh, representing the date, the number of years from the independence of, uh, of Tyre. So you can date these to the year. These coins were produced in large quantities, and they became the standard silver coinage in the Phoenician Judean area. The obverse features the representation of Melkart, also known as Baal, the chief deity of the Phoenicians. The reverse shows an Egyptian-style eagle with its right claw resting on a ship's rudder, referring to Tyre as a port. Now, ultimately, I heard that that was a real challenge for the Jewish people is that to have a minted coin with Baal on them is so such a sacrilege, but that was used in the first century. But uh, they were right. There was uh, one of the uh, commandments was against uh, showing any human being uh, in art. And of course, so this is against one of the commandments, but the Jews had it who were, were realistic. They mm-hmm. needed a coin to pay their temple tax. So yes. the, these coins were made of very high-quality silver, and uh, they were made for hundreds of years. So it, uh, the Jews wrote in their documents that these were the coins that uh, were acceptable for temple tax. Now, you know, when uh, Jesus overturned the table of the money changers, those mm-hmm. money changers were changing coins as Jews, when Jews came there from any part of the ancient world, they would have their own coins and they would exchange them for these uh, shekels or half shekels to pay their temple tax. Mm-hmm. And there was a, pro- pro- a prohibition against uh, charging too much for the service. Mm. So things were really uh, okay. I, I don't know what upset Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Could it be they were charging, uh, they were gouging them kind of like... No, the they, they... When they charge no, you, you know, they, $10 they were only for allowed to, They were only allowed to charge a certain amount. Mm. Maybe uh, where he maybe says you're some making my doing father's something house. Uh, illegal. <laughs> yeah, or uh, you're making my ha- father's house a house of merchandise. Right. Maybe he just didn't like that. <laughs> but it was a it was a necessity. And then ultimately, no, that, that was that as well. The uh, thirty pieces of silver that uh, Judas received for yes, the it was with one of the th- probably. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. nobody was probably one of the 30 pieces of silver. It was yeah. also uh, in Matthew uh, where it says, And take the fish when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. Take, then take this and give them for you 
and for Peter, so Jesus and Peter. So since the temple tax was a half shekel, they would they found this uh, shekel in the mouth of the fish, and it paid for the two of them. Yeah, so Jesus told Peter, you know, so they're not offended, just go fishing. And then when he grabbed the fish, it had a full shekel, which was, as you said, enough for Peter's half shekel and Jesus' half shekel. That's correct. Gorgeous. Yes. Amazing, huh? Amazing coin. <laughs> Amazing coin. Okay, next. Those are rather expensive these days. Uh, they're selling for uh, 500 grand, five hundred. Yeah. Five hundred to a thousand dollars. Sure, here for a the, simple uh, one. Here is here is some of the uh, references. At last, we come to the first truly Jewish coins issued by the Maccabees, who historians refer to as the Hasmoneans for some mysterious reason. <laughs> it's uh, all of the Hasmoneans issued small bronze prutas with double cornucopia, those are horns of plenty, on one side, and a Hebrew inscription on the other within a wreath. And uh, the inscription says, the name of the Jewish leader, in this case, Yehachanan, the high priest, he was the leader, the king was also the high priest, and it says his title, Kohen Gadol. Kohen means priest, and Gadol means large in Hebrew. And the council of the community of the Jews, Heva Yehudim. The reverse design features a pomegranate between double cornucopia. Yeah, these are more likely. Uh, uh, one of the, the, the type of the uh, widow's might. But there, mm -hmm. there are others that are considerable. And that was part of the uh, Maccabean revolt? Yes. Mm -hmm. This is a coin of the Maccabees. The last of the Maccabees is Metathius Antigonus. He ruled from 40 to 37 BCE. Mm -hmm. His short reign was subjected to persistent conflict against Herod the Great. Herod was appointed by the Romans as king of the Jews. Herod was ultimately victorious and executed Metathius in 37 BCE. The most famous and one of the rarest of all Judean coins was issued in the final days of Metathius Antigonus' reign, in a last-ditch attempt to rally the Jews against Herod's overwhelming forces. The small coins feature holy ceremonial objects from the Temple of Jerusalem, the seven-branched menorah and table of showbread. Mm. These are described in Exodus. And you shall make a menorah of pure gold. The menorah, the knobs, and its flowers shall all be one piece with it, and six branches coming out of the sides. Three menorah branches from its one side and three menorah branches from its second side. And you shall make a table of acacia wood, two cubits in length, one cubit in width, and a cubit and a half in height. And you shall place on the table showbread before me at all times. Showbread was the custom of placing loaves of bread on a table in the holy sanctuary. So you can see this is an amazing coin worth about $50,000. <laughs> wow. And that, that far right one is the table of showbread? Right. You can see wow. the table. You can't really see the showbread, but it's, mm -hmm. this is a think of this. This is a very small coin about the size of a dime. Mm -hmm. The widow's mite is one of the most famous biblical coins. The story of the widow's mite tells how in 30 CE, Jesus said over, by the way, I'm, I'm using CE instead of AD. C, BCE is before the common era. Mm -hmm. And uh, CE is the common era. And this is used by uh, archaeologists today. Sure. The story of the widow's mite tells how Jesus sat over against the temple treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, and he called unto his disciples, and saith unto them, that this poor widow 
have cast more in than all that which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she did cast in all that she had, even all her living. This is Mark 12, 41. And today, that widow's mite is a very, probably the most affordable biblical coin. Would you say? Yeah, you can, you can get a one for as little as $10 that's worn. Mm-hmm. And, you know, up to $50 should, should cover it. Yeah, and I'm thinking, do I have one here? I believe I do. Um, Here's my widow's mite. It's from around 100 BC, and it's encapsulated in an NGC slab here. Herod the Great's father was appointed governor of Judea by Julius Caesar. Generations earlier, his family had converted to Judaism. It is on one of Herod the Great's small bronze coins that a living thing is depicted for the first time since the Persian period. The eagle probably commemorates the event described in Josephus' War of the Jews. Here it is. Now the king had put up a golden eagle over the great gate of the temple. Later, young men set about the work with greater boldness. Their cause at midday, and while a great number of people were in the temple, and cut down the golden eagle with axes. This was presently told to the king's captain of the temple, who came running with a great body of soldiers, and caught about forty of the young men, and brought them to the king. Herod ordered those that had led themselves down, together with their rabbis, to be burnt alive. Hmm. He was a vicious one, Herod the yes. Great. Also, he, there's he, a... he was no better to his his children and wives, and he, he was pretty nasty. Yeah, and there's the uh, time of Jesus that the slaughter that's mentioned in Isaiah, uh, weeping, where Raquel would not be comforted, and when they believed that the Messiah was going to be born, there was a massacre because Herod wanted to make sure nobody else challenged him as king. So we, we understand that from the Gospels as well. Right. On the other hand, he did build, rebuild the temple and the walls. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did all that. After Herod's death in 4 BCE, so Jesus had to have been born around 4 BCE. When they were calculating the date of his birth, they missed by four years. Mm-hmm. So after his death, the Roman emperor Augustus divided Herod's kingdom among his three sons. Archelaus was appointed ethnarch, rule of the nation over Judea. And on this coin, if you can, if you ever learned a little... Uh, uh, Greek, mm-hmm. you can see epsilon, theta. Can you see it a on lot. the right? So I that's that. that's an an n. So yes. F, that's ethnarch abbreviation, and you can read it today. And on the other side is the prow of a ship, and you can read again in Greek. Uh, H omega delta going around. Yes, and I have one of those uh, right here. Let me show it to uh, Herod, and you can see it says uh, uh, it has the Greek letters. I'll post that as well. Mm-hmm. The book of Matthew described when Herod the Great was dead. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream of Joseph in Egypt. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Mm -hmm. So here again, you're holding a, a coin that Joseph could have held. Hmm. So we, there's four Herods, I believe, right? Oh, there are a lot yeah. of Herods, and in the Bible they call everyone Herod. <laughs> Bother to tell you which one. Yes. This is Herod Antipas, played a key role in the New Testament, adding to the desirability of his coins. The Book of Mark related. And King Herod, again, this is Antipas, heard of him, 
for his name was spread abroad, and he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead. The rare coins of Herod Antipas generally feature an upright palm branch surrounded by the Greek inscription, Herod the Tetrarch. The name of the city Tiberius, named by Antipas after the Roman emperor Tiberius, where the coins were minted, is featured on the reverse. Oh, it's actually on the left side. You can, you can see that very clearly. T, I, B, E, etc. And he was the Herod, I believe, that uh, requested for John the Baptist to be beheaded, if I remember that correctly. Right. You're going you're gonna to see that next. <laughs> A very rare coin depicting the portrait of Herod the Great's third son, Herod Philip II, when he was about 55 years old, was struck in 3031 CE, just about the time of Jesus' death, in Caesarea Philippi. This is the first coin to feature a portrait of a Jewish ruler. In 37 CE, Rome gave the lands of Herod Philip II to Herod Agrippa I, the grandson of Herod the Great and Miriam of the Hasmonean line. When Herod Antipas was banished two years later, his territory was assigned to Agrippa. By 41 CE, Agrippa I, descendant of both Maccabees and Herod the Great became the sole ruler of Judea. Apparently, it is Agrippa I who is referred to in the Mishnah, Jewish Oral Law, when celebrating the festival of the first fruits. Even King Agrippa carried the baskets of fruit on his shoulder. It was also Herod Agrippa I who stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he mm -hmm. killed James, the brother of John, with a sword, and he proceeded further to take Peter also. And he's also mentioned in the book of Acts where they say he's in the theater, and they say it's the voice of a god and not a man, and it says he was eaten with worms. Mm. The most common coin of Agrippa was also the only coin issued for circulation in his Jewish territories. This bronze prudus shows a royal umbrella on the obverse surrounded by the Greek inscription, King Agrippa. And you can see the inscription is very clear on this coin. It's Basilios is king, and then Agrippa swinging around. And the reverse features three ears of barley and the date L and a, a, a sort of an S symbol. It's the, this dates it exactly to the year 6, 42 to 43 CE. Next, an interesting coin. And now we come to the infamous Salome, daughter of Herod Philip II and wife first of Herod Philip II and secondly to Aristobulus. Aristobulus and Salome are depicted on this extremely rare coin. And uh, that's her on the right. So Salome. judge for yourself what a beauty she was. Well, I don't know. I don't think they knew how to uh, portray a woman on a coin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And this is a, this is a very rare coin, too, about $30,000. According to Josephus, Salome was the granddaughter of Herod the Great. Or she ma first married her uncle, Philip, and then she married her cousin, thus becoming queen of Armenia. Matthew tells how when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed by her mother, said, give me John Baptist's head in a charger. Hmm. The infamous Salome. Yes. The last rule of the Herodian line, Agrippa II, reigned for an impressive 43 years from 50 to 96 CE. This is the Agrippa who said unto Paul, Almost thou persuades me to be a Christian, from Acts 26 28. Mm -hmm. Coins issued by Agrippa II include both Jewish with palm branch and pagan with Roman goddess types. And here's an actual portrait of him.
Okay, here's a map showing the where the Roman governors called prefects or procurators ruled mm -hmm. from year five to sixty six. Roman appointed governors called prefects or procurators govern Judea with Herod Agrippa the first ruling briefly in the interim. The procurators ruled from 6 to 41 and then 44 to 48 and Agrippa for a couple of years in the middle. This small bronze pruder coin issued by the Roman governors abided by the strict interpretation of the commandments against graven images. And the commandment is, you shall not make for yourself a graven image nor any manner of likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. The first design introduced by the prefect Caponius featured a palm tree that later became a recognized symbol of Judea on coins issued by the Jews during the First and Second Revolts and also in the Roman Judea Captive series. When you mentioned uh, from the Ten Commandments not to make anything or any likeness. Now, how does that apply to this coin? Well, there is, you just saw before this, I showed a coin of one of the Agrippas with a portrait. Mm -hmm. And uh, that coin was probably not circulated in his, in the area that he ruled of Jews. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, the, uh, the procurators were ruling uh, the Jewish nation, and so they abided by the commandment, and they didn't have the Roman emperor, for instance, on their coins. I see. And I would imagine uh, the widow also did not put a coin with a, a portrait on it mm -hmm. as a contribution. Oh, the was made in, uh, in 30, 31 CE, the year of Jesus' death. The symbol is an August wand which was used by the Roman priests in the ceremony to predict the future. And here you can see the name of the emperor, Tiberius, around the left side. And the date LIZ is the year of the, uh, that the Roman emperor had ruled mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. So this is a very popular coin with collectors. How many would you say like roughly speaking or in circulation of a of a coin like that fairly easy to obtain would you say yeah that's a good question but there are probably there's certainly hundreds if not thousands yeah and i, I think that one lately has been kind of harder to to access and there's a lot of them that are not that great, you know, not the highest quality like this one is beautiful and amazing oh this one's fabulous yeah but there, there are some that are more like sluggish, more beaten up that are available. On right, that. and you realize all of these coins have been found underground by archaeologists. Well, the ones that's found by archaeologists probably end up in museums. These mm -hmm. are found with the people with metal detectors. Sure. And both the Jews and Arabs often dig up these hordes. Mm -hmm. Some of them are found in actual in pottery. People were saving money. Mm -hmm. You did an extensive review on this as well as the Shroud of Turin. Did you want to comment briefly on that? I, I guess maybe it's not a brief, <laughs> but that the Shroud of Turin's kind of made a comeback lately. And my understanding is they found two Pontius Pilate's uh, coins where the eyes were. Maybe you can just tell us whatever you know at, at a summary well, level what what you're. Are some, on, some on. years ago, a paper was, was written how there were coins of Pontius Pilate on the eyes mm -hmm. of, uh, of Jesus. And I debunked this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote uh, extensive articles on how these, the coins, the, the, the images that they found that they said were coins did not match any coins. Oh, and, uh, so that was fraudulent, the uh, the coins themselves. Specifically the, the theory the just, but the, 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 the theory never dies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you can read my entire book on the mm -hmm. Newman Numismatic Portal. N-E-W-M-A-N, okay. Numismatic Portal. Mm -hmm. And look up my book there. And okay. you can read the entire book. Go to amuseum.org and click on the uh, Ancient Coin book. That's an older version of the book. It has all the research there. 
And we'll put a link on the bottom of this video, Mel, that has wherever you want to locate. Right. Back to the Shroud of Turin, you yes. were saying you can speak to the coins that allegedly were on the eyes of Jesus in the Shroud of Turin and that those were not authentic uh, Pontius Pilate. It, it doesn't, it, the, uh, the specs of, of the image just mm -hmm. do not match the Pontius Pilate coins. I see. I see. In order for them to say that it did, they said there were variations and so forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you read the paper, I think it's it's very clear. I have it's all the uh, the images are there. In Jesus' time, there was a tax collected called the tribute for the Roman emperor. In addition to the numerous local Judean taxes, during one of during one of these collections, Jesus said, show me the tribute money, and they brought unto him a penny, which is King James' translation for silver denarius. And he saith unto them, whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar, and unto God the things that are God's. The word penny was used instead of denarius, which was specified as denarion in the original Greek text, because the English penny was the most commonly used silver coin at the time of the publication of the King James Bible in 1611. Mel, I wanted to mention uh, yes. on my last video, when I went in and saw Ira, this was my tribute penny. You can see that on the, the screen here that has Tiberius in it. And he right. told me, well, guess what? That is a foray. So this is like a, a first century uh, fake coin that somebody made back then and was trying to pass it off as money. He flagged that out of my ancient biblical coins. It's a silver coated coin. Mm -hmm. It's not yeah. made out of silver. So yeah. that's how they made the money. They passed it for its silver content. Yes. Oh, and there's one right there. Right. Now, this is actually the uh, the emperor's wife, uh, mother on the right, sitting on the throne. And the, that's the emperor Tiberius on the left. Now, Mel, I got a question for you. When I, see, I think I've seen enough of these coins, whether it's Nero or Tiberius or Julius Caesar, I feel like if you and I were at a party and Nero walked through the door, Tiberius walked through the door, and we knew that they were in the party, I feel like with like 85% certainty I could identify them. What do you think, like if we were to put them in a time machine and drop them in a party? Could you right. just, based on that image, be able to identify it? Could. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you find the images of these emperors on all their coins all the same they must have mm -hmm. they must have had the image and they gave it to the uh, mint engraver the engravers there mm -hmm. must have had a model they mm -hmm. must have all had a model of uh, the, the, what they were supposed to do and that's why all, all the images of Tiberius or Hadrian or Nero uh, look so much alike yeah, Vespasian, Titus, he, he, like he could pick them out of a crowd. I, I don't know. Hadrian is the one that I, I identify mostly with his portrait. For some reason, I, I would definitely uh, identify him in a mob. <laughs> <laughs> when the Jewish revolt broke out in the year 66, the Judeans quickly captured the holy city of Jerusalem, thus assuring them access to the great temple for religious purposes. And what was in the temple was the temple treasury, where all these half shekels and shekels of tire were collected over the years. Mm -hmm. From the silver in the temple, these shekels of tire and half shekels of tire, they melted them down, they made planchets, and they struck most famous of all Jewish coins, the Jewish shekels and half shekels. This is a prototype. Amazing that they, they have found about a half dozen of these. These are actually prototypes of the first mm -hmm. year one shekel. And this was sold by uh, heritage auctions for a million dollars. Wow, <laughs> that very one that we're showing here.
Yeah. The yeah. two sides of the shekel could illustrate what Maimonides described. When King Solomon constructed the temple in Jerusalem, together with the ark, were entombed Aaron's staff, the vial of manna, and the anointing oil. The Hebrew inscription is, uh, Jerusalem is holy. So anyone that says that Jews were not in the Holy Land in ancient times can see all of these coins as absolute proof that they were there. Mm, that's very interesting. This is actually the year five shekel, another $50,000 coin or so. And here you can see the difference in the design between the year five and that prototype shekel. The years one, two, three, four, five were all made with this design. And this has uh, the chalice that probably held the manna that uh, fell from heaven. Hmm. And on the other side is probably Aaron's rod. Mm, wow. Budding rod. Hmm. Uh, it's found the Ark of the Covenant. Others to say this is the... Uh, a pomegranate plant. I, I've written an article saying why I don't think it's a pomegranate plant. Mm -hmm. Bronze coins were also issued during the first revolt. This small bronze pruta features an amphora and grape leaf. The obverse inscription is year two. And the reverse inscription is significant, reading, for the deliverance of Zion. And right there on the lower left corner uh, of the uh, leaf is Zion, Zion. Mm. So this is the first time Zion has ever appeared on a coin. Now, is that the one, Mel, that uh, Ira was telling me about in our last uh, episode that he found a year five shekel? Would that be the same one? On the the previous was one was the year five shekel. Oh, this one, sorry. That's right the year there. five shekel. That's the one that uh, Ira picked up, and um, he was real excited about. That was like one of his uh, favorite finds of all time. I'll um, bet. He was real excited about, yeah. Okay. Half shekel, nice. This is, by the year four, silver, must, they were probably running out of silver in the temple mm -hmm. treasury, and so they struck uh, bronze coins. This actually says half, chatsi, on it. And the symbols are the palm tree mm -hmm. on the left. And on the right side are lulav and ethrogs, mm -hmm. which are symbol of the holiday of Sukkot. And that's the holiday of Sukkot will actually occur in uh, a couple of days. Coming up. Yeah. It's yeah. sort of uh, the Jewish Thanksgiving. Mm. Yeah, so we just hit uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur last week, and Sukkoth is coming. Right. Now, what do you do for Sukkoth? Do you, do you celebrate it? You eat in a uh, hatched uh, in a hutch that mm -hmm. you build, mm -hmm. and you eat your meals there. Nice. And also, you shake the lulav and ethrog. If you go back, a short <laughs> video... Of a, of a rabbi shaking the lulav and ethrog. Sukkot, th that commemorates when the children of Israel were out camping um, out in the desert and um, on their way to the promised land. I'm not sure. It celebrates the harvest. Mm -hmm. So the lulav and ethrog, the ethrog, you can see there, sort of looks like a lemon. Mm-hmm. And the lulav are, are, are four types of branches from four different trees. Mm -hmm. And what you do is you raise this up and you shake it to the east, the west, the north, and the south. Mm. It's kind of cool. All right. And it's cool that in, in two days is the holiday. Yeah. Okay. Perfect timing. Yes. Soon after the Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed by the victorious troops led by Titus in the year 70, his father, the Emperor Vespasian, launched an extensive issue of coins commemorating the hard-fought Roman victory over the tiny Jewish nation. I mean, it took them 
almost five years to defeat Judea. This is like, uh, I don't know what it's like. <laughs> it's like <laughs> Israel held out for a long time. Quite a long, protracted fight. Now, that Vespasian, I could pick that guy That's, out in a party. Yeah, that guy you spot immediately at a party. <laughs> <laughs> And there, that's also Vespasian. Yeah. This is a gold aureus. And there you can see the seated figure of uh, Judea, sort of like uh, if you had Uncle Sam representing the United States. And I'd like to point out, just to be a little political, that there's the name of the country below, and it's Judea. It's not Palestine. Mm, nice. It's af after... After the Romans defeated the Jews in the Second Revolt, which we'll get shortly, that's mm -hmm. when they renamed the area Palestine. Hmm. Now, Mel, like one of those uh, gold aureus, now those were more rare, and they're like a higher denomination of coin. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Like it could be a year's salary for soldier versus, uh, like, say, a widow's mite versus gold aureus. A gold aureus would probably be a small fortune mm, Yeah, in those days. So if you could get your hands on some of these, that would be really great. Right. It says it costs a small fortune today, too. Yes. Yes, indeed. Oh, go back to the other one. Oh, that's, mm -hmm. that's a magnificent coin. Beautiful By the coin. way, here they misspelled they spelled it J-U-D-E-A. Isn't that funny? Ah, you mentioned that at the beginning it's, of the video. It's valid. Yeah. And SC at the bottom means by consent of the Senate. Yep. Mm -hmm. And Beautiful. there you see the uh, the captives, the male captive on the left, and the female captive on the right in the palm tree. Yeah, and you know, in my travelings, I found that some of those coins like that one isn't necessarily so expensive, and you get a larger coin. Um, you get some more bang for your buck with those, uh, like maybe a Vespasian, because it's a little older, and then it comes on uh, a larger, the planchet and the size of the coin, versus trying to get your hands on one of these babies. This will cost you a lot of money. So. Yeah, but this, by the way, all the coins in this presentation are the finest ones I could find. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, these aren't your ordinary every day. So don't, you're being spoiled rotten. Yes. Coins. You won't Absolutely. find these coins often, usually. You're not going to spend a few hundred <laughs> bucks to get these babies yet. No, none yeah. of that. The Judea Captive series lasted for 25 years. You believe that? 25 mm. years under Vespasian and his two sons, mm -hmm. Titus and Domitian. Mm. Okay. That Domitian was a rascal. Yeah, he caused the Christians a lot of a lot of trouble. Nero, uh, Domitian, and then same for the Jews. I mean, uh, since Herod and quite a history there. Oh yeah, you know, oppression all the way back to Pharaoh, and to this day, you know, they're they're fighting um, the Jewish people just to just to survive. The Romans probably killed. More Jews killed an amazing number of Jews mm -hmm. and uh, ca caused others to go into slavery. And uh, probably because they built such nice architecture and had such nice sculpture, we think nicely of these people. But they're really like the Nazis when you think about it. Yes. Well, here's the story. In 70 C, after the fall of Jerusalem, many thousands of Jews were taken to Rome as slaves and others were exiled from Judea. Romans took over the collection of the annual Jewish head tax, which had been a half shekel. It was equivalent to two Roman uh, silver denarii. The Romans collected this tax with much zeal, so much so that it caused embarrassment to Jews and non-Jews alike. In a paper by uh, Marius Himstras, called The Interpretation and Wider Context of Nervous Fiscus Judaicus Cistercius. That's a mouthful. Cistercius mm -hmm. was this large bronze coin. 
presented at the International Conference in 2010, she came to the conclusion that Nervous Coin, this one, is very plausibly evidence that the new emperor no longer permitted people to be accused of living a Jewish life. This specific accusation became a wrongful accusation called calumnia. Towards the end of this of Domitian's reign, high-ranking Romans accused of living a Jewish life could have their property confiscated and they could even end up being executed. Hmm. This is the coin issued by Nerva that commemorated the end of that uh, embarrassing collection of the Jewish head tax. The Roman emperor Hadrian who ruled from 117 to 138 CE, commemorates his visit to Judea in 130 CE. This probably kicked off the second revolt because he wanted to convert the Jewish temple to a Roman temple. Hmm. This Cistercius shows the emperor receiving a Jewish woman and two children who carry palm branches. In the background, a bull appears next to a sacrificial altar. Hmm. The altar was a reference to the god Jupiter Capitolinus, to whom Hadrian had dedicated his new pagan temple. And in fact, he renamed Jerusalem Aelia Capitolina. On to the Second Revolt. If I understand right, Mel, there was two major Jewish revolts. Is that correct? It's 70 uh, AD and around 130 Right, 66 uh, to 70 was the first Mm -hmm. revolt. Mm -hmm. And what's called the second revolt is about 130 to 135. The funny thing is, I didn't cover it here, there was a revolt in between those two revolts. Mm. But... uh, we don't <laughs> we don't talk much that there were no coins issued for that that's probably why that's yeah. the, that's the uh, year one and a half revolt <laughs> mm-hmm. this is the commonly called the second revolt mm-hmm. that was uh, the the jews revolting against uh, rome at the time it's exactly it's because uh, hadrian came and uh, renamed the city and uh, built a new temple on the site of the old jewish temple Mm-hmm. And then when they were under Herod, there was never a revolt, but at the time, he was like kind of a half-Jew, if I understand correct. They were... Well, his family sort of... had converted to Judaism. Mm-hmm. So I don't mm-hmm. think he's a half-Jew. I mean, <laughs> uh, Maybe his father was, the... was Jewish. That, that was it, yeah. So I guess if you're 50% Jewish, you're a you're basically 100% Jewish. Well, he wasn't so, 50% Jewish. It was uh, it was come came from a convert. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's not like his father was Jewish and his mother was not Jewish. I don't know anything about his mother. If his father was Jewish and his mother was not Jewish, you could say he was half Jewish. They just say that his family had converted to Judaism. Hmm. But he didn't uh, he didn't put his portrait on anything. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know. It's a good sign. The leader of the Second Revolt was Shimon Bar Kokhba. He was known as Bar Kokhba, meaning son of the star, in reference to the messianic expectations of the verse, there shall step forth a star, Kokhba, out of Jake. One of the most famous uh, rabbis of the time, Rabbi Akiva, proclaimed Bar Kokhba as the Messiah. Mm. All of his coins were overstruck. Now, there's no more, the temple had been destroyed in year 70, so there's no more silver in the temple. So all the coins of Bar Kokhba were, were coins that was in circulation in the Holy Land. Uh, they could have been uh, Roman, Greek, uh, Syrian, uh, and they were overstruck. They would file off most of the old design, heat it up, and hit it with new dyes. Mm. So that's true of every coin of Bar Kokhba. And on some of the coins, you can actually see the design underneath, parts of the design underneath. So they're literally taking the old coin, melting it, and then re-stamping it. They didn't melt them. They probably heated them Mm -hmm. and then hit them with the new dyes. Hmm, interesting. So any uh, Bar Kokhba coin, is, that's the case? It was a reused coin from previous? That's right. 
Mm-hmm. The bronze and the silver. Mm-hmm. Um, the overstruck silver tetradrums, that's a, a, a large silver Roman coin, it's called tetradrum. They're called cellas, S-E-L-A in Hebrew. They're among the most religiously significant coins issued by the ancient Jews. They depict the Holy of Holies within the Jerusalem temple, along with the ark that purportedly held the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. Jerusalem was inscribed above the temple in the first year. So you can see those letters. By the way, it's not hard to recognize the ancient Hebrew letters. Mm -hmm. If you look at the top left, you can see something that looks like a W. That's an S. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's click. And the first letter on the lower right is a Y. And you can see it's actually related to our own alphabet. Mm. And that's the Holy of Holies depicted on the that's left. That's right. Side. And you can see there's two dots in the in the very center. Yes. That's probably the uh, Ark of the Covenant. The pieces of wood, the staves that they were, that they used to carry around the Ark of the, uh, the Ten Commandments. Actually, <laughs> mm. wow. And on the right is, again, is Lulav and Ethrog. It's interesting. First revolt and second revolt. So this must have been a, an extremely important holiday mm-hmm. to the ancient Jews. The so-called star above the temple, you can see that, appeared in the second year of the revolt. It looks more like a sunburst of light on many of the coins. And that's one of the reasons why this may represent the golden candelabrum over the opening of the temple sanctuary donated by Queen Helena of Armenia in the early 1st century CE, about a half century before the Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. Tosefta suggests that it not only had its own light, but early in the morning it reflected the sun's rays. Thus, when the priests wanted to know whether it was already time to say the Shema prayer in the morning, they had only to look at Queen Helena's candelabra. So, uh, Beautiful. It's also thought to represent, I said, Shimon Bar Kokhba, Simon and the star. That's the other theory, presents the star uh, of the Messiah. Mm. Now, if we wanted to grab this coin, it probably cost us a few bucks, this one in the picture. Yeah, it would cost thousands of dollars. The first mm-hmm. one is rarer than the, than this one. Ah, oh, there's Queen Helena, a picture of Queen Helena's golden lamp. Following the defeat of the Second Revolt, Rome renamed the area as Palestine. Here's an early coin minted about 130 CE in Jerusalem, renamed Aelia Capitolina by the Romans. The Emperor Hadrian is pictured on the obverse, and the uh, Roman ceremonial founding of the city is shown on the reverse, with the emperor shown in a cart pulled by a bull and ox. And they would go ar- around the city which would define the boundary as the area enclosed by a plow in 24 hours. You can see at the top, C-O-L is Colonia. Mm -hmm. Another great example of the coin. Beautiful. And, And this is just an interesting coin featuring a zodiac issued by the city of Akko Ptolemaeus, uh, if you go to Israel today, you can visit Akko, and features Salonina, the wife of Emperor Galenus, from 253 to 268 CE. And finally, here's how the modern state of Israel has revived the symbols of the ancient coins of Judea on its coins. The ancient coin on the right and the modern coin on the left. Yeah, the one on the right is got the three weeks, kind of like a widow's mite. Type of uh, right, that three ears of barley mm-hmm. and a harp on the bottom one. Is that right? Right, beautiful coin. Mm. Now, the one on the right, oh, that's the second Jewish revolt, uh, right? The, and the f- upper one is from uh, Agrippa. Now, that harp could have been, I imagine, uh, the same that uh, David when he played his harp for Saul. Um, something similar because he would have been for a few hundred years previous right. there, were two t- there were two types of harps on the coins one uh, 
with a few strings, one with more strings. I don't know if I showed them here. That is actually, you now know more than most people in, this, in the United States about <laughs> ancient Judean coins. And uh, as I said, you can read my book free on the Newman Numismatic Portal, or you can get it on Amazon, or if you contact me, I can get you an autographed copy. All right. Yeah, yeah. I find, uh, you know, having the hard copy is the way to go. I have found the PDF version as well, you mentioned, Mel. We can put all the links on the bottom of this video. Uh, sure. For, and I yep. think that concludes our uh, slides. And if they want to contact you to get, say, that autograph. Director J-A-H-F at yahoo.com. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please contact me. Mm -hmm. And the book is nice. It has... Uh, has many maps in full color, and every coin is depicted in full color. And because a lot of these coins are small, in the back of the book, I have enlargements of all the small coins. Mm -hmm. Now, you and Ira no longer have that deal for 30 bucks a month. You will send me exotic coins from Israel. That, that seemed to uh, be passed, uh, is my understanding. Uh, I think it's been I'm past two years. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if years. anybody wants uh, interested in getting some coins, I am soon going to sell my collect my collection. Oh, uh, wow. But uh, you know, I would be willing to sell individual coins now. Well, it's been fantastic having you. It was great that we could uh, connect finally, and yeah, we'll get this edited and posted soon. Great. And, uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, this was fun. It was nice doing it on a day that I di didn't think I was going to do it because I was nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. By Thursday, Perfect. I would be good nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so we jumped the gun. That's we just perfect. jumped it and jumped in, and it, and it worked sure. out nicely. That's fantastic. Yeah. So we have uh, so we had Ira on your close buddy, and uh, you guys are just kind of inseparable. It, it seems. <laughs> we went to Israel once. Yeah. It was fun. That's awesome. We we're planning to have uh, David Hendon on uh, next month. Well, David Hendon's book is the Bible of yeah. ancient Jewish coins. He has every coin type that yeah. there is in his book. I would suggest starting off with my book and mm -hmm. uh and then going to his book if you want further information yeah that's the uh the the big one right here I right and this this baby looks like it's a few yeah it's like a few hundred pages so that's the exhaustive deep dive so that'll be next but thanks again mel it's been awesome appreciate it thank and, you uh, for we'll doing this really mark well. i appreciate it you bet it's been my pleasure thank you sir Bye bye. Shaking the lulav and etrog. Shalom. We want to look at our lulav and our etrog that we're going to use for this holiday. The Torah tells us, "Visamakta bichagecha." You should be happy in this holiday. This is a very happy time of the year. The Sidor calls it "Zman Simchatenu," the time of our joy. And it really has to do with the harvest. At the harvest time of the year, we worked all summer to produce food. We now have food. We, be, we have the, the product of all our hard work. So we take four of the different kinds of things that grow in the land of Israel, and we wave them in a, in a way of suggesting that we're celebrating this wonderful time of year. You then say the blessing. It's Baruch Ata Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kirishanu B'mitzvotah V'tzivanu, Al Natilat Lulav, which means praise are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe. So we're going to wave it this direction east. We're going to wave it south. We're going to wave it west, north, up, and down. Look around your homes and appreciate all the wonderful gifts that you have. Happy Sukkot.